Hello and welcome to Kingston Now. I'm Jimmy Buff. This week we'll take a look at the Kingston Candy Bar, a new uptown business. We'll talk about the Rear Center for Immigrant Culture and History in Kingston, and we'll start with Bruce McPherson, the owner of McPherson & Company, a book publisher here in Kingston. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Jimmy. How now, you're you? back. You were here yes. a little over a year ago, but mm -hmm. for people who might have missed that program, McPherson & Company is a publishing house here in Kingston for how many years? Um, about 20 years. About 20 years. So you publish works of fiction, uh, local authors, um, more or less is what well, that... Well, yeah, I do some, <laughs> do some nonfiction in the arts. Okay. A anth little anthropology. I, I have a fascination with experimental cinema. Um, so uh, I do really, I sort of go wherever my interests. Now, a little over a year in. ago, you had an extraordinary success with one of your authors, an old college uh, friend of yours, Jamie Gordon, who you had been publishing over the years, won the National Book Award for her book, Lord of Misrule, which is just a, a stunning achievement. Um, like the AAA farm team. It was astonishing, team. that's right. for sure. Yeah, it was really out of the blue. And right. it was actually now, you know, the time is passing because it's, it's, it was 2010. 2010, you know, okay. So here we are going to the third after that. But, so uh, how, what has that meant to um, McPherson and company? As, as Well, it certainly raised my profile in the publishing world. And, uh, you know, it gave me a little bit more means to uh, explore some of my interests in ways that I might not have been able to do otherwise. And uh, A lot of unsolicited manuscripts oh my God. suddenly on your doorstep. <laughs> everybody, mm -hmm. everybody. But, um, uh, you know, I, and I can only do a few books a year. So... You know, it's I'm a disappointment to so many. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones you do publish, right? So yeah, they're pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, and and you brought some of those with you. Can you tell us about some of the stuff that you've got going on right now? Yeah, uh, this is book. Uh, these are books from the last uh, couple of years, and one forthcoming book. Um, the first one I'll talk about is um, George Robert Minkoff's um, conclusion to a trilogy called "In the Land of Whispers," which is about the uh, entire Jamestown experience told through the eyes of Captain John Smith, um, including the backstory of um, uh, Francis Drake, uh, the great you know, privateer who harried the Spanish. And uh, so um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a monumental work and uh, it was finally finished. And Minkoff um, uh, is a rare book dealer in uh, uh, Alfred or uh, which is a little burg right next to Great Barrington, and worked on this for many, many, many years. It's and a work of historical fiction. It's a work of historical fiction, and uh, but but with, he 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 really um, uh, learned the history uh, thoroughly, and so that uh, historians uh, have applauded this book, you know, it, and considered it perhaps the best retelling of the John Smith, uh, Pocahontas, Poatan. Uh, uh, encounter and the establishment of the first American uh, foothold um, uh, by the British. Um, so it, it's it's a thrilling story. It was it took us years to do this. Uh, I think the first volume came out in 2006. This came out in uh, 2011, and uh, the whole thing is about 1,200 pages, uh, and is now being optioned by Francis Ford Coppola for a. A series which we hope will be made and wow. we'll just have to see what happens. So know. do you pick up your phone and Francis is on the other end? No, 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 like no, that, no, no. Lawyers go back and <laughs> yes, forth. It's, yeah. really it's a wonderful cover too. Um, it's a great image. It's a tobacco plant. It is, yeah. it is. Uh, it was drawn in about 1560, which is was right at the beginning of the tobacco craze in Europe. And uh, tobacco the, was one of the, was the reason uh, for the um, continuance of the colony. Originally, the uh, colonists came over for gold and uh, easy riches, and uh, um, uh, they had to settle for tobacco, which was not easy to do, and it took them years before they were able to establish it as a crop. What are some of the other books you have with this? The, uh, the next book is one of my um, uh, audience favorites. This is a book I originally did in 2004 in a hardcover edition, and um, this is a... Um, uh, 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 the story of the Taj Mahal. It's a romantic, lush, historical novel about the building of the Taj Mahal and the civil war that took place between two brothers, one an Islamic fundamentalist and the other a, uh, a, a poet, savant, uh, philosopher who uh, wanted to bring the two conflicting uh, uh, elements of India together as one country and uh, unfortunately he did not 
went out. And therefore, 400 years ago, the fate of Pakistan and India, or a divided continent, was, uh, was settled. It's been a crowd uh, favorite for, for 10 years now. Um, and um, uh, for, uh, it's in about 17 languages around the world. It's been a bestseller in a number of countries. Um, and uh, so I brought out this new edition uh, just this spring. And next? Robert Cabot. Um, Robert Cabot I published originally in uh, 1999, uh, a, a collection of three novellas. But before that, in about 1970, he became famous for a little book, a novel about the Southwest called The Joshua Tree. And then for the last 10 years or so, he uh, had been working on a, a novel about um, a sort of Roman uh, about a friend of his, uh, um, an American named Kevin Andrews, uh, and uh, who died uh, in Greece, uh, but who was a fascinating character, uh, uh, a writer himself. And, um, Ka and it's, a, it's a book about grief. It's a, it's a book about um, uh, the main character going back to Greece to revisit uh, the haunts where he knew this uh, character to try to find out um, what happened, why why he died, and uh, uh, it's a fascinating unraveling of the history of uh, these two men from the days of World War II, before World War II, all the way into the 1980s. So as, as publisher, what hooks you first? Is it the story, the idea? Is it the writing style? It's the writing, it's the voice. It's the it, voice. It, there has to be a real authentic voice. And there are distinctive voices in all these books, I'm, yes, I'm assuming. Yes, each one. Each one, and and you know. so it, it the, the 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 sort of connecting thread is it's just got to be an authentic voice. It does. I mean, the richer the better. The more interesting, um, uh, you know. Some people will call it poetic. I just call it a, a full. You know, um, rather than the plain style, I consider it the full style. Uh, the ability to use all kinds of devices, uh, full vocabulary, language. Um, um, uh, I guess there's a kind of expressionism involved in the books that I do. The um, future of book publishing, how does it look to you? Because there are e-readers now, things like that. What is, how is that affecting you? Um, well, um, I'm dabbling in it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, so that I sell um, some e-books of, of my books. But, uh, you know, I'm, I, I publish, as you see, hardcover books always first before I turn them into paperbacks because I like the physical book and I want a permanent object and I believe that the uh, reading experience of a book is, um, is different, is fundamentally different. If it's well designed and, uh, and uh, thoughtfully presented, I think it stays with you but more. It's not simply a passing thing that, you know, you can delete. Um, I think it's something that, I want to make something that people will hold on to, that they'll pass along, that they'll give um, to friends, that uh, will stay in libraries uh, for as long as possible, that will hold up under repeated use, you know, so that's well, my it's, approach. it's terrific work and we appreciate you stopping by again and telling us about what you've got going on. Thanks. You're watching Kingston Now. The next to come from McPherson & Company is Sea of Hooks by Lindsay Hill. Publishers Weekly said this first novel by poet and one-time banker Lindsay Hill is less a novel in the traditional sense than a spiritual biography of a broken boy's coming of age. Nearly every paragraph astonishes, every moment rich with magic and daring, reminiscent of Robert Persig and Herman Hesse in his concern with authenticity, Sea of Hooks also has the unbearable anguish of Kafka's diaries, making for an unforgettable trip. Next on Kingston Now is Jeffrey Miller to tell us about the Rear Center for Culture and History in Kingston. Welcome back to Kingston Now. The Rear Bakery used to serve baked goods to Kingston, but now the restored bakery will be home to the Immigrant Cultural and History Center. And here to tell us more is the chairman, Jeffrey Miller. Hi, Jeff. Hi. So you're, you're, the, the bakery is almost restored, right? No, it's just the, actually it's just in the be, in the beginning stages oh, of in the, the beginning uh, stages. restoration. Yeah, okay. this is the um, we're about to begin the first project uh, now to restore, to deal with uh, drainage problems and to restore the part of the building that was worse hit by the uh, water problems and the neglect from thirty years of being closed up, and then we have to go off, you know after more grants for 
follow-up work to finish to open up the whole thing. So how did you get involved with the project and how did you pick that spot for, for the center? Uh, well, in 2002, I was on the uh, board of the Jewish F Federation of, of Ulster County, which, which I'm still on, and we did a um, Jewish H History of Kingston e exhibit down at the Visitor C Center downtown as part of the 350th a anniversary of the founding of Kingston. And as part of that project, I was doing an oral history of uh, the Rondout, and um, I was standing on that corner of Spring Street and Bro Broadway with Marv Mi Millen's, Millen's Steel, um, and he was describing his family homestead, which is right at the bottom of Meadow Street, which is uh, now Garrigan Drive. And while he was talking, I looked over my shoulder and I looked through the front window of the bakery and it was like falling down a rabbit's hole. It was literally just as it was when the building was built. And it was a functioning ba bakery for the entire 20th century up to 1980. And they never modernized it except for a little thing here, a little thing there. And so I was intrigued by that, and I said, what, what a great place for a mu museum, and uh, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Federation, uh, Hi Jaime Rear, who was the last of the bakers still alive, he was in his ni 90s, he de deeded the building to the, to the Federation to turn it into a cultural se center. That was my idea and, and the committee's I idea from the, from the beginning, and Jaime liked the idea that his building, which was his home his whole life and his work would be immortalized as a uh, center for everyone to, to enjoy. What will the final center be like? Have you envisioned, I mean the restoration is just beginning, have you envisioned what the f experience will be like when people walk through that door? Well there are, there are two, two aspects to the to the center. One is the actual bu building itself, and that's one project to get the money to restore it to, you know, to uh, uh, create the asset for Kingston for, um, you know, to have this this building that's right up at the top of the historic di district to be re refinished. Um, and the building will speak for itself. The bakery will be restored, uh, both the retail space and the, and the oven room where the, where the rolls were made. Uh, it still has the coal-fired oven in there. Um, and then there'll be uh, room to restore apartments that are up, upstairs as people would have lived in them in whatever year the museum interpreters that we have to hire down the, down the road. Uh, feel makes the most sense for the for the whole bu building. Then there's the rear center for immigrant culture and history, uh, which grows out of this, but is separate from the building itself. In other words, the building can exist without the rear center. The rear center can exist without the building. And the purpose of the rear center is uh, when you take a look at uh, Jaime Rear and what his family stands for. Uh, for a place like Kingston, it becomes a very good avenue to discuss the whole issue of immigration, uh, which, I mean, one could say the Dutch were immigrants, you know, they took over from the Native Americans and uh, then the waves of immigrants that have come since, especially starting in the 1820s, which is where my interest mostly be begins, is in the uh, beginning of the in industrial age because like on one side of 1820, Rondat was a couple of farms, and within 10 years' time, the canal opened, the steam travel came, waves of Irish came in, and the, and the city just blew open to the point where within a few years, it e eclipsed Kingston in terms of the population. The, the impression is that Kingston was a, a largely um, Irish immigration, as you were talking about, but you discovered other, right, obviously you know of other um, ethnic groups that came to Kingston. Who are right. some of those? Well, the, the Irish came first to help build, build the canal, fo followed soon by the Germans who also worked on the canal, um, and some were merchants. And then there were Jews started to come in around the 1840s, mo mostly the German Jews, because um, there were wars in Ger Germany that were un unsettling. So, um, and then followed la later in the um, 
19th century by the Italians and the Polish. Uh, the, as the cement industry grew, the brick industry grew, it brought pe people in. I know the brick industry used to uh, bring in migrant workers from the South, uh, uh, African Americans, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so a lot of groups just sort of came to, together by, by 1900. It's a, uh, a compelling story to be told about Kingston, and we're looking forward to the center opening so we can see it, and we can also see that restored building. Uh -huh, thanks. thanks. Thanks for doing the work, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> this is Kingston Now. Next, if you've got a sweet tooth, we've got a great new business to introduce you to. Stay tuned. You're watching Kingston Now. Let's head over to Wall Street and check out the newly opened Kingston Candy Bar. So the idea for the candy bar was actually kind of an accident. My daughters and I were at dinner across the street at Gabriel's Cafe. And after dinner, I thought, you know, there's no place anymore really to go and grab an ice cream cone, walk around. I remembered when Jane's Ice Cream had their retail store on Wall Street and thought about it for about 15 seconds and then went home and had a little conversation with my husband, whose store still is here. Uh, Jay stuff is still in the back. And uh, he sublet the front of the store before to another company. And um, I had asked him, I said, you know, there's somebody that's interested in thinking about opening up the candy store on Wall Street. And he says, oh, really? And he's got a sweet tooth, so this is great. And I said, yeah, and they think that the front of your shop would be good. And I think that's a great place for this to be. But, uh, you know, they're just starting out. They don't have a lot of money. And, you know, we need to know if you'd be reasonable with the rent and the sublet. And I know that he had sublet before dirt cheap. So when he said yes, I said, howdy, partner. So the first thing that we did beyond the getting over the shock of actually deciding to do this uh, was start doing research. Uh, a little bit of information about retro candies, old-fashioned candies, what kind of nostalgia. Um, I'm really into food history and food trivia, so candies with stories um, are interested me. So we made a list of things, inventory that we wanted to start with, and then really tried to balance it between the old-fashioned retro stuff and local Hudson Valley product that we wanted to display. And the rest of it, we were just winging it day by day. You know, we'd come in and say, oh yeah, there's yellow and blue paint, let's get some pink and make stripes. Or um, that we had a completely different idea for the displays, but Julie from Edelweiss Soap Company had these stands that we were just able to paint. So as things fell into place, the store fell into place. The candy is sold by the pound. Most of it is sold by the pound. So the idea is to keep it simple, that you can come in, take a bag, and mix and match. Uh, then there are some things, pastries that are sold individually, but even the fudge is sold by the pound at the same price as the bulk candy. So we try to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, Jane's ice cream, which has been made on Wall Street for, I'm not sure how many years, on it, for a really long time. When I first moved up here, they had a retail spot. And right now, Vincenzo's is there, their pizza place but it's still manufactured downstairs in the same location. So it's kind of a no-brainer for us. It's just as if it was made here because all I do is call Bob and Amy and they wheel it down or carry it down. So it's really convenient, it's really fresh, and you don't get more local than that. So we have a bar here now, and the bar came because of a Facebook post. There, um, the, the techsmiths that are renovating space on um, North Front Street, Sari Botten, placed a post and she said, we have this bar, it's made out of recycled doors. Does anybody want it? So I thought, yeah, it'd be kind of cool because people have come into the candy bar and we don't have a lot of seating. In fact, before we've had no seating other than that one little bench. And it's been a kind of a, a sticking point for some people. So I thought, well, yeah. Um, and it was easy to get. We literally got a bunch of people together and walked the bar down Wall Street and put it in and we've gotten a couple of bar stools so now you can enjoy a sundae or an ice cream soda sitting at the, the candy bar. So uh, Kingston Candy Bar is open uh, every day. Right now we're open Monday through Saturday from noon until nine and on Sundays from 12 until five. And I'm gonna say the noon until nine on Fridays and Saturdays is a little flexible because when BSP has an event, we're open until the humans stop coming in. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were open a little bit later in the summertime. Uh, we have a website, kingstoncandybar.com. Not a lot on the website yet, but we have an active Facebook page. Again, just 
you know, search the Kingston Candy Bar, and you can get an idea of what our specials are and new candies that are in, and you know, or stop in. We're at 319 Wall Street. It's a no-brainer. There are so many reasons to be in Kingston. The people, by far, make this community some place that we want to be. We want to live here. We want to play here. We want to worship here. We want to be here and be part of it. And once you're here and part of it, you can understand why. Uh, that there isn't a place like Kingston. It's so special. I juggle the candy bar and the Queen's Galley breath by breath that very often I'll be at the galley and doing candy bar work or I'll be here at night doing Queen's Galley work, answering emails, talking to donors, working on fundraisers. So it's not really separating them, uh, although I think the original plan was to separate them. The reality is that they're just kind of meshing together, just like balancing my family life, you know, having my children here as part of this. So it, it's a challenge, but it's absolutely self-inflicted, and I still love every moment of it. My name is Diane Reeder, and this is a Kingston Candy Bar. That's it for this week's show. Thanks to Bruce McPherson of McPherson & Company. See their catalog of books at mcphersonco.com. And thanks to Jeff Miller of the Immigrant Culture and History Center. Find them on Facebook. Remember, all of our previous shows are available on our YouTube channel, and you can find that link on our Facebook page. For Kingston Now, I'm Jimmy Buff. We'll see you next time.